good presentation and that, but Barry just, every time I saw you, it just kept getting better and better and better and better until I was away from sidecars at the time, but you had one of the Campbell boys on the back and it was really well presented. You guys are absolutely flying. But the problem was you started having some health issues. Now, um, I've heard all sorts of silly rumours, but I'm very sure you'll tell me the truth and it's not as bad as it sounded. But you were having some vertigo issues or something? I had a, yeah, I, I did have vertigo once. Um, but I the last real probably meeting I had was I went to Rockhampton one night and I did a, oh, I think I, I did one race, but I was more on the infield than what I was on the track. And I thought, I just did the barriers. We got to park this thing up, mate. I said, it's too dangerous. Like I, I couldn't pick where the track was. I, it was really bad. It wasn't vertigo. It was just oh, some sort of giddiness, I suppose. Um, and yeah, so we parked up because we didn't want to hurt ourselves or somebody else, you know. It was just a safe thing to do. So you definitely did the right thing for sure, but I just wanted to know that personally because I've heard, you know, it's like Chinese whispers, it gets more and more and more every time, but you totally obliterated that when um, you raced up in Bowen last year and you were absolutely flying. What was that meeting like? Fantastic. Probably the best. Well, I broke my leg pretty bad in 2015. And then I had um, 18 months off and Barry put Wes Jenkins on the bike for a while. And um, then we had to do, I hadn't ridden in oh, 15 months, I think it was, since I even sat on one. And we had the Queensland title at North Brisbane and um, I had to do time trial. Anyway, uh, Wes had finished with the bike, so I'm back on it. We had three three flying laps, three lots of times out there. And, I was just changing setup all the time from Wes. The first time I went out, I was, I think I come 11th fastest. I think there was about 20 odd or something in it. Then the second time I was fourth quickest. And then the last time I went out, and I was about two hundredths of a second slower than um, uh, young Trent Headland. He was fastest and I was the next one. I was pretty happy with that. But then the meeting got rained out, so the meeting never went ahead, but yeah, and that was really, oh, probably a couple of months after that was the last time I rode one, which was that night at Rockhampton. And then that was probably four and a half years before I sat on one. I never, never really even sat on one. And young, um, young friend of ours from Brisbane, uh, Luke McGrath, bought a bike off Dave Haven. And he just rang me up and said, you, you want to have a ride on this thing? And I thought, yeah, why not? I said, I, I just want to see if I could still ride one, basically. It's been a long time. We went to Bowen for the Gary Moon and I had two laps practice and my first race I got third in that behind Tyler Moon and then the next two races, one was Brody Cohen and Amos Golding were in it. I won that one and then I won the next one. Uh, I won the next one with um, Stuart first and then I got oh, I got a second to Scotty Christopher. Yeah, I, ended up, I went there with an idea if I got eight points I'd be happy. I'll end up getting 11 points. So yeah, I was pretty happy with that, yeah. Just like motorsport can be very cruel, you went to the Queensland titles um, after that down in down in Brisbane there and the bike just didn't want to play the game. And then I went out in my first race and the clutch failed and it was sort of unrepairable on the day. So yeah, we never even got past the tape from the first race. But hey, these things happen in Speedway and that's just how it goes. But yeah, no, it was, I appreciated the ride greatly. And um, so, but at this stage, you never know, something else might happen. We might get another ride down the road again. Moving on from all that, what, what's your day to day now? Basically, going to work every day and trying to put some money away and pay off a few bills and 
So I, I guess my next step is I'm going to be retiring one time, one day down the road, you know. Yeah, has been a lot of miles over your career, a lot of um, a lot of travel. What's some of the funny travel stories you got where things just went to absolute garbage and you've had to make light of it later, but at the time it might have been very, very frustrating. I probably can't talk about a lot of that today. I said, but you know, when you when you do a lot of travelling down the road and you get tired and everything's funny and everybody giggles at anything and everything. But yeah, look, with either Barry or Bob Cowley and Neil Gould and them blokes, you know. We never stop laughing and we never stop giggling and we always just taking the mickey out of one another the whole time and yeah it was it was really good you know we we had some great time who are the people that you really miss being around just because you knew on the road trip it was just going to be giggle central and there was always going to be something going on But when I do go to Speedway, I want to ride. So I try to stay away from it a bit. Unless it's a really big meet, I'll go and watch it. Um, but, you know, like you said before, it, it never goes out of your system. And, and I've done, done quite a few different things in life as sport. And the greatest blood rush I've ever had in my life is sidecars. And always will be the greatest blood rush. But, yeah, look, I miss I miss the trips away with Barry and the Bob Cowleys and them. And I've got an old mate of mine. He... Um, he come along by mistake through a friend of mine, and his name's um, George, and he's probably part of the furniture these days at North Brisbane. He's just one of those guys. He come from Melbourne originally, and um, a mate of mine knew him. He drove up to the Queensland title area, or the Australian title at Brandon one day, and he moved to Deception Bay, and him and his wife. And... Way. So I just said, oh, can you come around and see me? Because I want to race that meet. And, if he's, and he's always been, he used to race sidecars himself in Victoria. But George is probably, I don't know, he'd be 76 or probably near 80 now. But still very fit. Still. So he basically come to my house and we talk under the house. And, and we, Barry and I have had him for the last 20 years. And he comes everywhere Barry goes or everywhere I used to go. George was always there. There was always a seat for George. He was... Yeah, I do miss George. George is a great guy. Barry's great, you know. All the cowley here and that, we had a lot of great times. Yeah, so. But and just the people, you know, just the people you race. Um, they're all great people, you know. They're all, we all have a lot of fun, you know. I'm so glad you brought George up because I was terrified that since I was away, he wouldn't be around anymore just because of age, not because of his fitness or anything. But every time I've been at Brisbane, I've seen him and he's exactly the same dude I met oh, 15 years ago or whatever. And he is hilarious. I, I love being around him. But we used to rubbish him about the drives back down to near Deception Bay the, where all of a sudden he'd stop talking to Barry about the turn off to Deception Bay. Bill Rowan trying to get somewhere near him. Wayne Mark pushing hard. Gray's not out of this by any Still working hard. He's going to hang on desperately to the front run. The man Mark's got it. And doing it in fine style. Uh, George was... Um... Yeah, George is just, he's such a nice man. He, he's one of them guys, he, he's never drank in his life. Like me, I've never drank, he's never smoked. His whole life's just been about sidecar. That's his whole life, you know? Ever since he was young, he, he used to ride, I think he had a Vincent back in Victoria. And and um, yeah, you know, he was just one of those guys that just, he just lived and breathed sidecars. And and we give him a second, a second win, you know? Like he had a bit of, you know, bad luck stories with family wise and and I don't say he was ever depressed, but we gave him a new life and he loved it. And he, you know, we loved having him. We wouldn't go anywhere without George. And he's a good talker, you know, so everywhere you went, you'd have to grab him or someone's ear and say, Come on, George, you've got to get back in the car, we've got to go, you know. 
He's never going to be that heavy. Oh, that bloke's ear is bleeding too, George. That's another one you've got, you know. But uh, but he was good. He loved it. You can you can hang it on him all day long, but everything was just a laugh for George, you know. Who was an absolute pest with pranks and that over the years when you would rubbish each other and that either side of meetings? Who was an absolute pest that would get you with pranks every time? That's a hard question, Dave. I know when we were young, we used to, you know, like the Peter Christopher, which is Scotty's dad. We used to have a lot of, and we were playing pranks on one another all the time. But I can't tell you the one I've done to him. I can't say it on air. But, but yeah, we'd, um, we'd always be into one another. And you know, all, the, all our riders back in them days, you know, we'd, we're always having pranks and carrying on. But yeah, no, it's been good. You've seen a lot of evolution in sidecars and, you know, with the machinery and all that sort of thing. Have you any thoughts as to where it could go next? Like what could be the next thing you see coming in? Uh, but my idea would have been, I, I bought the gear to do it, but we never actually got the time to do it. And I'm too old to do it now, but I wanted to put like a, uh, probably a 16 inch hoof here on the front, uh, which would give you more footprint on the ground, on the track. And a hoof here on the sidecar wheel, where, cause a, a, a straight hoosier, basically a fairly straight hoosier that would go across the ruts and to build up a dirt a lot easier, which would, and then obviously we can't run a hoosier rear tire now because we will. But then I think if the better you got that bike to steer, the better you got that bike to handle, then the more drive you could give that bike. You know, if you've got a bike that wants to push its brains out and, and doesn't want to handle nice well, it's no good adding drive to it. You've got to get take the drive off it. But, I think the next thing we're going to learn now is how to create more drive. And and I, I feel, especially on your hard slick track, is that a really soft bubble gum hoosier on the front and something on the side, and then get that thing a bit shorter again and get that back wheel, get that wheel driving harder at the back. I think that'd be a good thing. You know? Back to your career and how long it has been You've been through passengers like everyone does. Has there been any passengers where they've hopped on and it's just been immediately that they've clicked with what you do on your bike and it just felt right as soon as they got on? Uh, Hayden Campbell. He's on with Scotty Christopher now. And if I was to start riding again, I couldn't get him back. Wouldn't that be a bugger? But anyway, but I'd never do that thing because he's on probably the rest, best ride in Australia, in my eyes. And I would never do that to Scotty or him. Uh, and honestly, I, I had that Luke McGrath on, with me on his bike there at Barlow, And he just made my job so easy. You know, when you can put a passenger on the back and they're doing their job right, you don't even know they're there. And that's what both of those guys could do really, really well. But you could, um, you, you didn't even know they were there. You didn't have to think about them. They just made the bike go forward. They made it work properly. Have you ever been a passenger on a sidecar at any point in time? I think I got on the side of one once with um, uh, Mike Kent, Bob Cowley, when he first put that V twin Yamaha in there, he said, if you want to ride this, you've got to get on the side with Mike. And that was enough for me. That was around the old Gold Coast track, like the old surf raceway there. And I thought, yeah, well, that's I've done that bit. Right now, give me the handlebar. <laughs> you know? And I think after riding 10 years of solos, you know, it's like there's a few guys around that were solo riders and they're quite, uh, probably really good sidecar riders because they know what Speedway's about. They know about how to get them out the starts. They've already done that apprenticeship back on the solo. They know lines. They know the proper lines and how it all works and how to get power to the ground and stuff like that, you know? So, yeah, certainly solos was a big asset to, you know, I'm not saying I'm a Darren Claw, never would, but to be able to go around and be fairly consistent like I was, yeah.
a lot of it's interesting you say about the whole passenger thing because a lot of the things i've seen over the years is um a lot of passengers initially get on they do their time or whatever you want to call it and then they progress to the handlebars um is there anyone that you've got your eye on that's um going to be something special on the handlebars in the coming uh seasons Uh, well, I mean, Justin Place did prove that, didn't he? You know, like, he, um, you know, he was a passenger with Darren and he went out and won Aussie titles and he's a real hard charger. And then you've got, um, look, I think Scotty Fish is going to be another good rider with a, you know, it, with a bit of just more time. Um, what's um, what's uh, young Hayden Campbell? He was with me. He's had a couple of rides on the handlebars. He goes around good, but he rides a lot of dirt track as well. And now he's riding a, a, a solo. But yeah, they, they already know the lines. They already know how to get it to the ground. And yeah, I I, I, I no doubt that Hayden Campbell will probably make quite a good rider, without a doubt. What are some of the things that you think can be done moving forward with sidecars just to do i guess kind of like what i'm doing where i found it quite sad that i started a job and not one person knew what a sidecar was let alone a speedway sidecar so what are some of the things that we could do to get the sport back into the public eye i guess you'd say You know, I watched on the Gold Coast when we raced around Labrador there, and they had those big grandstands, and it was always, Speedway's always had the, the older English style person, the old, like me, the old grey headed fella sitting up there. And eventually, as they pass away, that seat doesn't fill back up, you know? And you see them, they sit in the same spot week in, week out, because modern day entertainment, there's too much televised, there's too much nightclub stuff, there's too much of all that. But live sport like Speedway, as soon as those older people that just followed Speedway their whole life passed away, no one went back into those seats. So it's just, it's got to be, what you're doing is an awesome, awesome thing. Um, and I think marketing your clubs. Your clubs have got to start to market sport, like get people in there that have never been. Get them, give them a free family pass. They're going to spend money at the bar and they're going to spend money at the food stall and everything else. And next time they come, they'll probably be happy to pay. And if you've got 20 passes out there and you've got, three lots of people come back every time time after time the sport's going to grow you know it'll help it immensely what were some of your rituals or ways to get through meetings like did you i don't know have to have a rabbit's tail in your pocket or anything like that Uh, at the end of the day, I'd be, you know, I'd have people laughing and giggling and I'd get to the riders' briefing and tell them all the updates from home and away. And that's about fun. Don't try not to let it stress you. Some people, look, we all get butterflies and anyone that says they don't is not telling you the truth. But don't let it get to you, you know. I was probably, it used to get to me a lot when I get the final. I could win, like, you know. I could win a lot of heats and I could win the win a rapid charge, but when I come to a final, I was a bit of a choker. But it doesn't matter, I had a good time, you know. You just gotta go there and enjoy it and don't try not to let it don't let the pressure get you. Pressure wrecks a lot of people. What was some of your favorite music when you were going to the speedway? I was never really into a lot of music when I was young, but I, I was a pretty big Susie Quattro fan, Blondie fan, ABBA. Yeah, I didn't mind them, they were good. I can still listen to them today. Wayne Muck on the inside, Phil Rowan next to him. Just coming up to fill that gap. Rattle off some of the people that have been very special to you in your career, whether they be behind the scenes, on the track, whoever. Pop Rivers, Greg Way, sidecar passenger. Uh, Bob Cowley, he was a big help to me at the start of all this. Mike Farrell actually 
put Bob Cowley on to me. Um, and then, you know, you go further down the road and you've got like, um, you know, Barry Raffin and, and he's, and then he had sponsors like Keith Muller from Keith for Wheels and Tommy Lay was Triple M Motorcycles. They used to help me with the tires, him and Keith. Um, you know, yeah, there's all sorts of people like that and chip in a bit of money here and there to help you out, you know. And of course, my old wife, you know, the old girl, she, uh, she never ever once tried to stop me. She, that's what, that's your passion. You go and do it. You got to do what you got to do. And you know, I, I was still racing competitive at what I don't know, 50, 58 year old or something, you know, and and still doing it. Not a lot of people do that, but but you know, it's she she's been great over the years. Places I've been, I've been all over Australia with it. You know, we never had much money, but we got there and we did it. We had to do it. I had commitments with sponsors, so we went and done it. You know. the support of someone in your life whether it be female male whatever is so very important because then it allows you that freedom to know that you can be who you are and you can go do the things that you want and all that sort of stuff so if it was down to you had to have one more ride and that was it and you could have whatever bike that's fine what would be the one track that you want just one more ride on I'd have to say probably Pioneer Park. Pioneer Park's always been my favourite track. It's the best, you know, I rode there. Look, I, I, I rode a, I rode bikes around there the first night it ever opened. And at 58, I was still riding around there. And I don't think there's anyone in North Queensland that's ever done that competitively in a competitive manner. You know, that's, I rode that when I was 16 year old. And at 58, I was still going around the same form, you know. Um, but yeah, you know, Pioneer Park, great track. Uh, I love Bowen. I love those the little tracks and, you know, it's, um, yeah, no, it's good, yeah. They'd they're, they're, they're be sort of my main thing. I do like the tracks up here in North Queensland. They suit me. So, yeah. Well, we're pretty much at the end of what's probably acceptable amount of time to talk to you because, like I said, I could just, short of wanting to grab a coffee, I'm ready to talk for the rest of the night. But... I just want to say thank you to you for talking to me because regardless of no one ever sees this, I've I've got a massive kick out of doing this interview, that's for sure. And Dave, I'd like to say thanks very much to you for doing it. But also, the big thing here is I think what you're doing for the sport is just absolutely marvellous. And keep doing it, mate. You're doing a great job. privy to this but I, I knew you went through some physical changes um in 2013 did you have any health issues or anything like that i did dave i um i had a i had a, a cancer but there was a lump that come up on the side of my neck here overnight it just popped up that side of the small marble and my daughter forced me to go to the doctor in the Burdekin in air that, that morning, it was a Saturday morning, and I went through all sorts of procedures with ultrasounds and, you know, PET scans, a whole lot, but anyway, what they did a test on the lump and it was, uh, it was a can- there was a cancer in the system, so they then went on with other tests and they found out that, that well, they took, they took tonsils out and tested them and then they took a saliva gland out, they took some lymph nodes out and they couldn't come up. So I basically had a cancer, what they call an unknown primary. The lump on your neck is secondary and, and they couldn't find it. And it wouldn't have been about six, well, three, three months later, six months later, I'd go up every three months for checkups. And I had a little mole thing on the back of your head here and it was really itchy and sore. And they did a biopsy on that straight away and it ended up being a melanoma. And they said that's more than likely what it was because I grew up in Townsville in the sun and we never wore hats in the early days and stuff like that. So they took that out and, um, um, and yeah, I've been fine ever since. But while I was, 
while I had this chance, so I was, there was a couple of meetings come up at Bowen. One was at Bowen on a Friday night, and one was at Brand and Flat Track on the Saturday night. And I said to the specialist, I said, look, I race a sidecar, but am, am I going to be able to ride the sidecar with this with this illness? And she said, yeah, you can do what you like. Just try and live your life as normal as per, uh, possible. And I, you know, I'll just step back a step here, but when I when I started to have this treatment, which was over five weeks, they told me that after a couple of weeks, I'd start to get all red and sore in the throat, you know, which I did. Um, my skin started burning and going crocodile skin and all that sort of stuff. And the um, when I had that meeting, I had to go back to the Monday, I go back for more treatment. And on the Tuesday and the Thursday, the Tuesday was ner- meeting with the nurses. And the Thursday was a meeting with the specialist. And she said, oh, the, the nurses said, oh, yeah, how's your throat? Is it still sore? And I said, no, it's not sore anymore. And they said, what do you mean it's not sore? And I said, well, it's not sore because I raced my sidecar twice and the adrenaline rush healed a lot of the pain. And I said, no, I do, I'm a great believer in adrenaline fixes things, you know. Anyway, so they had a look down my throat and my throat wasn't red or nothing. And it wasn't till about... You know, they were amazed. They said, we need to invent some sort of adrenaline tablet, you know? And I said, oh, I don't know what you do, but it certainly helped me. But uh, it wasn't until about the last week that I actually started to get a sore throat again. So, you know, it's certainly racing the bike and having a good adrenaline rush like that certainly helped the, helped the situation I was in, that's for sure. <laughs>